Substance, not excess. Success is in the asking and not the getting. That may sound very Pollyannish, but the fact of the matter is we've seen this time and time and time again that the job is in the asking and not the getting. Because often as you ask people to support your organization, you are bringing them into your fold. You are educating them. So particularly during these strange economic times, we've had a situation a couple times even with Bill Jake's place where we've asked somebody, <clears throat> we've talked to somebody about our organization and they said, you know, I'd really love to do something, but I just can't right now. Things are really terrible. And then a few months later, we get a check. And somebody says, I really loved your organization, but I just was not able to make that gift. Now I can. So the fact is, the, the, I honestly believe you do your job when you make the ask. We talked about the success of different giving strategies yesterday, and 49% of the time, asking face-to-face -face someone you know is effective. That's reflected here. And one way, uh, my wife knows this very interesting guy who sells a product that you would think nobody would ever want to buy, and he does very, very well at it. And uh, <clears throat> he believes those same statistics apply to his particular business. And every time he gets a no from a potential client, he gets excited. <laughs> and I said to him one day, I said, Mike, why would you get excited when you get a no? He goes, because the next one's a yes. <laughs> I mean, you talk about your half full and half empty, right? <laughs> but he can do that. But, but Mike Smith is a great salesman because Mike Smith knows that every time he gets a no, it's likely that that next person he talks to will be a yes. And it's the same thing in asking for support. We need to ask those likely to know. We're not talking about prospect cultivation. And one of the mistakes that people sometimes make when, we, when, they, when they hear me talk about this or when they hear about yesterday's presentation is they forget all that time <coughs> that we spent talking about constituency. You know, and it takes time to build a constituent. You know, when, Bill and I, we leave this seminar and we'll turn our phones back on and we'll find 27 new emails from my wife, right? <laughs> that she's copied us on about the information that she's sent different people about Bill Jake's place. We're not asking those folks yet. We're just starting the relationship, you know? We're prospecting, we're, we're cultivating them, hoping they will become our constituents. So it's your constituents that you need to use these efforts on. The ask itself is a very logical process. And if you've done anything in the world that motivated someone to do something, like buy something or form a positive opinion, it's the same type of process. And the way I like to do it, and everybody does it a little bit differently, but the way I like to do it, and I found has been successful, is begin with a well-worded one-page letter, a fully personal letter. Dear John, it's good to see you last Tuesday at the such and such meeting. I wanted to write you and tell you about a very exciting project that we are doing at the ABC Mission. I will call you on such and such a date to set up an appointment so we could discuss this project further. I believe your involvement could make a significant difference in the success of this project. I'm looking forward to speaking to you and hope you will take my call next Tuesday. Short to the point, I don't tell them anything about the project, I don't spell out the whole deal. Now let's be clear, nobody is fooled here. They know I'm calling to ask them for money. See, they are, they're, people are intelligent, I don't expect them to be dumb. I expect them to then know that my note is essentially an entree to get in the door and to talk about money. So I don't do any of these things here. Are you purposely stroking his ego? Sh sure. Sure. That's true, though. It's all true. Okay. Yeah, it's all true. So you don't say you don't No, absolutely. Yeah. The tough part is the call. The, yeah, go ahead. I think that's a good point. You said it a couple of times, but 
you talk about sales techniques and then there's being truthful to people. And sometimes if, if being truthful is a sales technique, that's fine. But if you just technique people, they see that. Yeah, I think they do too. Right, exactly. You know this, uh, the, yeah, I, the, one of the people that, when I was looking for a car recently, my lease was up and I had to get a new car. I knew what I wanted. So I went to specific dealerships and this one guy was like, he was right out of central casting. Well, a handsome guy like you, what are you looking for a date? I mean, I mean, it's just, <laughs> I mean, it just, you know, the whole thing was like so phony, even if he had, and I had, a, I couldn't find the car I wanted. It was really a hard time to find the car I wanted. But, you know, even if he had the car I wanted, I wouldn't have bought it from him. Because he just skeeved me out. He was just so phony. But, you know, uh, I, and the guy I eventually bought the car from, we talked over the phone two or three times. I went actually to do the deal with him. And he says to me, which I thought was a very interesting approach, he said, uh, well, Jim, it seems to me you're the kind of guy who did a lot of research on the Internet. Well, I mean, why don't you and I talk about what you found out? And I said, yes, I did. And I took out the cost sheets, and I took out what his profit was, and I took out what the buyback, I mean, the, the holdback was, all the stuff that I knew that you could find today. And I said, and this is what I think is a fair deal. Right here. And he said, I can do better than that. Would you like to make a deal? I said, absolutely. It was like the shortest process and was very honest, above board. I talked to him a couple times on the phone in a very business-like fashion. I knew my numbers. He knew what I was prepared to pay. That works. It works. It's the same thing that works in this world, too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, comment and a question. First thing is the stuff you did before about you've got to give before you can ask and all that mm -hmm. stuff. In many ways, it seems like what you're doing is preparing us executive directors to to prepare other people to ask for us. Absolutely. And so... You and know, you too. Right. You know, that's one of the things, when, you know, in a nonprofit staff, we often ask that question, how many people in the staff give here? And they go, well, they work here, you know. <laughs> so obviously our board members, and, but the other thing is, I, I'm recognizing, like, I think a lot of us think, like, well, we're sitting here learning how we should make the, I'm the executive director. Well, I wanted to do this as if you were the guy doing it, because right. that's the best way to... But present. the reality is, is that almost everyone in this room, um, if I'm listening to you right, they should, the executive director perhaps needs to ask board members to make asks. Absolutely. And identify the Mary who's well spoken and well liked and everything. So what you're saying is, is that it shouldn't just be one person in an organization. No, everybody in that organization that's should be able to ask. Okay. Right. Now some people could do it without ever being trained. The second question is, is when you say send that letter, mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking on the annual appeal, I understand why I'm going to get a bond, a bonded letter and with a first class stamp and everything. But in my world, I, I think I get maybe one real letter a month now. I know, it's so rare, isn't it? Everything is an email. I know. And so the question is when I'm calling to say, it was great to see you, I'd like to call you on Tuesday to make an appointment, can I send an email? Uh, the, the short answer is yes, of course, but uh, you just answered the, the point by saying you get so few personal letters. Part of the reason that that process, the CPAT process works, is because there are so few personal letters. Part of the same reason that you get this person to perhaps be available on the phone next Tuesday at 10 is because they get so few personal letters that they pay attention to it. Now, I'm not saying you can't use an email. I'm just saying this is what I use because I know it's so rare. Even in this day and age. In, in this day and age, it's so rare that people respond to it. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, two, two scenarios <coughs> that I've, I've been in the previous organization, I'm, I'm like your comment. Uh, one is uh, I don't want to give you the money for this thing, but I'd like to give you the money for this other thing that mm -hmm. you're not planning to do. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And the second is, I don't want, personally, I don't want this guy's money because he's, he's being, uh, insert noun here. He's being what, I'm sorry? Insert whatever noun you wish to use to describe someone who you're not enjoying spending time with. Okay. Um, 
So, on that case, I turned him down and basically said, it was a, I don't want your money. Uh, uh, but, so, could you comment on those two scenarios? Maybe specifically the... When the first scenario, I think, is the more... Uh, the, the second scenario might be, uh, and I hope you understand this way, it might be your thing, Garrett. Uh, you know, and maybe that's something <laughs> you have to figure out, and I don't know if I have the answer to that, or, you know, maybe we need to discuss it some more. The, the first thing, though, I've had that happen where somebody said, you know, that, uh, the ABC sounds really nice, but I'm really interested in a DEF. And if you guys want to do a DEF, I'm going to fund that DEF. Well, that's very interesting, Mrs. Smith. I, you know, I really am so happy to see that you're that interested in our organization. I'll tell you what. I would like to get you involved with us so we can discuss whether or not a DEF is appropriate. I'm not in any way going to say, yes, we're going to do this. Um, and uh, it, would you like to meet with some of the people in our such and such committee so that we can discuss that? I think that's a, something that deserves a lot more of attention than we can certainly give in our half an hour here at lunch. And what you're doing then is you're bringing the person into your circle. And you, this happened with, um, um, there's a famous place in Ocean City where a lot of speakers go. I don't know if anybody's, nope, I didn't want to say the name, but anyhow. <laughs> uh, they uh, had somebody that wanted to build a bell tower. And the board and the executive director and everybody else wanted a carillon. They have a carillon. And um, so this went back and forth with this major donor for a while. And they essentially brought this major donor over a course of two years into the planning and the future of this organization as a member of this special projects subcommittee and the special projects subcommittee had already approved the carillon and they then they showed ex they by bringing this person into their world and showing them exactly what they were doing and why they had chosen this and and being seriously listening to what a bell tower would mean this person changed their mind and funded the carillon I think the, the answer to the second scenario was the same as the answer to the first. Okay. Okay, maybe. I, I mean, I think we, need, we could have talk about that a bit. But, I mean, that's what happened down there. I was working with them at that time, and they had this person who had lots and lots of money wanted a brick bell tower, you know, with, with old-fashioned cathedral-style bells in it. And, and uh, you know, they wanted a carillon. And they had... Like I said, this committee had approved this carillon after years of planning and, and work on what the future of the tabernacle would look like.